thank you very much, Roger. Sorry for giving you a heart attack and turning up to the cricket club instead of the university. <laughs> Absent-minded professor, as they say. Um, so it's it's a, it's a great honour to be invited here. I don't think I've been to the national one. It's, I, this is a learning experience for me as a doctor, as possibly for you as well. But it's a two-way pathway. I learn a lot from my patients, and I'd like to share some of the experiences with you. Um, so as you say, I'm a, I'm a mainstream oncologist. I treat prostate cancer with brachytherapy, radi formal radiotherapy, chemotherapy, abaracta, and then delusional, etc. Uh, but um, more recently, we've, um, we, we run a research lab at Cambridge and Bedford. Uh, we do lots of uh, mainstream research. We've had 60 patients in the CHIP study. Um, we, uh, I led the RT01 study in Bedford. So we, we're not against mainstream treatment at all. We obviously we're very proud of the achievements of mainstream uh, medical treatments. But I'm very interested in getting the evidence for lifestyle and self-help strategies, because I think that's an area where there is a lack of evidence and a lot of hearsay. Um, so fortunately, the chance of actually um, being cured for prostate cancer is, is improving. When I was at some 20 years ago, it was about a 30% chance. Now it's uh, uh, well into sort of 80s and 90s. You could argue that's because of the early detection. But I think some of that is because of uh, you know, better treatments. Um, the other thing as well, of course, the big difference is that you, if you have metastatic prostate cancer, the, the chance of, of uh, living with that disease is, has significantly increased. I mean, if you speak to Nick James, who recently presented in Asperger's, he's saying, we're looking sort of, you know, for 10, 15 years possibly with metastatic disease, whereas when I started, you're looking at about 18 months. So there's a lot of people living with prostate cancer being cured, cured or living for a long period of time. But of course, it's not all about having lots of birthday cakes and living longer. It's about the quality of life. And, um, and that's, you know, just, as you know, just as important. And many people who have chemotherapy, abaracturin, et cetera, radiotherapy, surgery, are living with the long-term consequences of cancer treatments. Where, you know, there could be anything from, from osteoporosis, to weight gain, uh, nail changes, poor sleep patterns, obesity. And these are the things um, patients of, often come to us as an oncologist say, you know, what can we do about it? You know, I see 40 patients in a day, five minutes of consultation, as this couple of people can ver verify that. You don't get a lot of time, do you? Uh, so, you know, it's hard. You say, go back to the GP. The GP says, oh, no, you've got cancer. Go back to the hospital. We've been told to discharge patients. So that's the face. Um, which patients are often given when they want to talk about the long-term consequences of treatment, and that's why groups like this they are very important because you can learn off each other and to provide some evidence for There was an initiative from um, Macmillan and the uh, Department of Health, uh, which was the <coughs> National uh, Cancer Survivorship Initiative, and I was fortunate to be asked to the evidence base on behalf of Macmillan for that which tried to look at the collective the data, but didn't do it in the actual trials themselves. So what we've done in our centre in Bedford is to try to uh, have a theme of lifestyle uh, research. So we look, we do scientific reviews, we ask patients, more than and we do randomised controlled trials. And with that data, we publish in medical journals, uh, which are you know, marginally read. Uh, we publish in, in more interesting journals like the British Journal of Sports Medicine, who is the highest citation journal we've got. And we're more and more branching out to sort of rather strange things like cycling weekly, because you know, cyclists are very worried about prostate cancer, so we did a nice article <coughs> reviewing the evidence for cyclists, reassuring them that there's no risk for cycling prostate cancer, my dad. And we give data to the Smithland and other <coughs> groups for their. Um, manuals, their leaflets, which you give to patients to help you improve the accuracy of that. And we share our data also on social media, so we have a blog where we have a chef coming in every month making healthy recipes. So if we say to a patient, you need to go and have quinoa and buckwheat, and they say, what? They can click on the B on the website, and they see a chef showing how to prepare these rather unusual foods, why <coughs> they're healthy, and a, and a little video explaining all about it. And that's proven to be quite popular. We have a newsletter which goes out probably once every two months, highlighting again lifestyle issues or any child which are topical at the time. Um, we're particularly interested, and Stephanie shared this afternoon, so we've got this sort of um, um, 
complement each other. He's particularly interested in interaction between gut health, obesity, sugar, chronic inflammation, polyphenol rich foods, and exercise. And how these all integrate, interact with each other, not you can't look at these separately, to, 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 to kill cancer cells or try to fight cancer cells, but just as importantly, to reduce the risk of chronic diseases uh, such as arthritis, dementia, uh, osteoporosis, and heart disease, which are all more co common. So I'm just going to go through these in detail. We know the data from large cohort studies. These are studies where they followed people for long periods of time after cancer. They looked to see who exercises and who doesn't exercise. And it's quite clear if you're able to do three um, demonstration of exercise there. <coughs> um, if, if, uh, if you were able to do three to five hours a week of moderate exercise where you get quite um, where you get uh, quite breathless when you're doing it, you have about a 30% reduced chance of your prostate cancer coming back. So you know there's people argue whether will they have a randomized data, you're not going to get a randomized trial in prostate cancer with a thousand people exercising five hours a week five thousand people are not following them for 20 years, so you know, all the people who argue for that evidence is not going to happen. The evidence comes from cohort studies, and there's lots of robust evidence. How does exercise have an anti-cancer effect? Where there's 180 biological changes occur when you start exercising. Um, so your blood actually changes to, to fight cancer. Um, so you have reduced inflammation, you improve your immunity, you improve your antioxidant enzymes, uh, you, you alter the expression of the genes you were born with. So you could say, well, you know, I've had a saliva test, I've got dodgy genes. Actually, if you exercise, it suppress, it can suppress some of the genes which are bad and enhance the genes which are good. And there's other critical benefits such as you lose weight, you can improve your mood, and you can improve your ability to exercise outside. Robert, could you try and throw your words a more? You know, there's no microphone, no speaker support at all. I will try to speak. Can you, can you hear it back? Not very well. Not very well. Um, well, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that uh, the best thing you can do to prevent that is exercise. Um, and there's a, a meta-analysis in the BMJ showing that, looking at 33 randomized trials, showing that uh, exercise is the best thing to reduce chronic fatigue and improve overall quality of life. So that was a, uh, an evidence review in one of the best journals we have. Osteoporosis. We know that uh, men with androgen deficiency are more prone to osteoporosis, which you might not even know they've got until they've tripped on the pavement and get a crushed fracture of, this, of their back, get severe pain, or they trip on the pavement, fracture their hip, they end up in Bedford Hospital, get a superbug, and that's the end of the story. So uh, we want to avoid... Um, <laughs> um, so we want to avoid um, <coughs> being admitted to hospital, if at all the time, there's a good correlation between being in hospital and being ill. Um, so, uh, but you know, many people, GP say, go, you know, go for a walk. Well, actually, walking doesn't do much for osteoporosis, nor does cycling, nor does swimming. There was a lovely study from Australia which looked at people with established osteoporosis doing squat exercises against standard exercise, and there was a significant reduction in osteoporosis. So, if you want to treat your osteoporosis or prevent it, you have to do weight bearing exercise, and preferably extra weights. No, no one in that trial had an increased risk of a crush factor. So people who turn around and say, oh, you can't get patients with osteoporosis to do this because they've got a crush factor, complete nonsense. A randomized trial said there was no risk of crush factors and improved bone, uh, bone density significantly. And of course, it's not just about exercise, it's about the foods we eat. Many <coughs> people say we need to eat meat to get the protein. Actually, meat increases the risk of osteoporosis. Plant-based proteins reduce osteoporosis, such as soya, quinoa, uh, lentils, uh, having a healthy gut bacteria improves osteoporosis, and of course, sun, mm. careful sun exposure, <coughs> and calcium-rich foods. And we have another website called keephealthy.com, which is picture-based, so if you click on that and click on the picture of the 
bone will take you to the last evidence-based lifestyle strategies to improve both bone density and good health. So it's a, it's a holistic approach. Uh, sexual activity, well, you know, this is multifactorial. If you cut through the veins, supplying your penis, uh, in those of supplying your penis, of course, it's, there's not a lot you can do. But after radiotherapy, then many people will recover sexual function. And this was a study we did uh, looking at people who had pelvic radiotherapy. There was 400 patients uh, who'd been treated in Cambridge. And we looked to see uh, if they exercised, overweight, or they smoked. Uh, and the biggest uh, correlation to whether they would later develop erectile dysfunction or pelvic uh, toxicity, such as uh, rectal bleeding, etc., or incontinence, was whether they exercised. How many people are told when they start radiotherapy they need to go into an exercise program? Very few. Anyone in this room were told to go into an exercise program? Well done. One, two, three. <coughs> Message is getting over. Um, and um, I, I hear that Roger was on the nice panel. And, and now, if you, if you start androgen deprivation, you actually, uh, hospitals should advise patients to go on a 12 week exercise program. I don't know if anyone's been told to do that. You should actually be in the first exercise program. Has anyone been started an exercise program? No, that's actually in nice guidelines. So hospitals will get fined if they don't do that, but it's not paced very well. Um, we've heard about mental health. I'm not going to dwell on mental health, but it is obviously important. Exercise is one of the best things to help mood. And why is it important to prostate cancer? This was a study from California looking at 41,000 people with prostate cancer. And they did specific questionnaires looking for depression, and they found that 1,800 people who were clinically depressed had a, a, an increased chance of their prostate cancer relapsing and dying of it. So these people were depressed, and they jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. They actually died of prostate cancer. So it is very important to, well, we'll hear more about that later, so I won't tell them that. You're going to tell us how to avoid it. <laughs> um, uh, and cognitive function, we saw the data last year, androgen deprivation increases the risk of cognitive function, but you can do a lot about it. Exercise is a very good way to keep the blood supply to your brain. It's not just about exercise, it's again about having a big gut health. One of the biggest factors, one of the many factors, making sure you have all the three rich food, plant based proteins, etc. Et and again, we have that, you can click on that picture on keephealth.com and get to. I'm always criticised for overemphasising the benefits of exercise, but I need to talk about risk just on a bike. On a it's really hard to get any risk unless you fall off the pedal. <laughs> um, people say, what about androgens? Exercise increases your testosterone. Well, it does for 20 minutes, then it drops, and actually the androgen levels drop. So the evidence is exercise reduces androgens not increases it. So cyclists, for example, have a big problem with low androgen. So, and, and many cyclists have to give up cycling because the androgen levels drop too low. So it's a complete myth that exercise increases testosterone. Free radical formation, yes, if, if you do anarchist, if you went out now and sprinted down the road, you will generate free radicals which could damage DNA, uh, but that's why you need to train properly. You, you gradually increase your exercise threshold. And it is important to have lots of, sort of polyphenol rich foods which help uh, deal with these free radicals. And that's why uh, you get extreme, um, that's why you get cyclists. And I've started cycling, and the, uh, the food supplement I'll talk about later has its own cycling team, which I advise. And I'm now a, a professor of sports medicine at Coventry University, so I did a lot with these people. And you know, there's a whole industry of nutrition before and after cycling. Most of it involves polyphenol rich foods which reduce free radicals, they reduce joint pains and they improve muscle recovery. So that's why you see hundreds of these sort of supplements with you know, uh, turmeric, broccoli, uh, um, beetroot, etc. Obesity. Well, we know that if you're overweight after prostate cancer and other cancers, you're more likely to relapse. <coughs> But the most important thing is um, sarcopenic obesity. You can actually, I mean, I was overtaken in America a few years ago by someone who's twice my size. That person isn't unhealthy. You know, that's just a big person who happens to be fit. What's unhealthy is you get a big person <coughs> with a small person inside. So if you look at that uh, 
picture there on the right, you know, there's a small skeleton, low muscle mass, but lots of, um, lots of fat, and that's called sarcopenia and obesity. And the definition is low muscle uh, mass, poor grip, and low gait speed. And there's a lot of work being done on sarcopenic obesity now. That's a very serious problem. You have higher cancer risks, you have poor outcomes from surgery, and you have, you're unable to tolerate treatment, and you're more likely to progress and relapse. Exercise is particularly good for sarcopenic obesity because it improves your muscle mass before you get weight loss. You can lose weight if you're overweight by exercise, but it's hard. You have to do a lot of exercise. You only get, even in the best programs, you only get 6% reduction in weight. But you actually get the benefits of exercise before you get the weight loss. So you should say to people who are overweight, don't worry if you're not losing weight. You are still benefiting. You're benefiting by improving the muscle mass. It's helping your arthritis, improving your immune vitamin D levels. So it's very important to do that. Um, in terms of losing weight, the best study I saw recently was from JAMA, uh, American Children's Medical Association, and it looked at people who fasted overnight for 13 hours. They had, uh, so just a, a questionnaire saying who, who did that habit, who had their dinner at say 6 and had their breakfast at 7. They had a lower risk of inflammation, <coughs> a lower risk of markers of um, diabetes, and it, this was actually breast cancer patients, but I'm sure it applies to prostate. 36% reduction in breast cancer <coughs> relapsed. Um, so that simple <coughs> manoeuvre, having your dinner early, eating later, nothing in between except some tea or something, is very effective. And I also add to patients, well, why don't you go for a walk before breakfast? That will extend the interview, interview you're not eating, and then you're exercising on an empty stomach, so you have to find fat as the source of energy, and hence you lose weight. The other thing is reducing the processed sugar. We know that processed sugar is very bad for obesity because you have a hit of a cola or a, or a fanta or whatever, you get that instant relief if your blood levels go up. But an hour later, because your insulin levels have gone too high, you, uh, you, you go into the hypoglycemic period, you become hungry and you want to eat again. And also the sugar itself has got lots of calories, it's, more, it's, it's less satiating, so you don't get full anymore. So you don't get full instantly, you've got room for more food, and then you want to eat an hour later. If you have slow-release carbohydrates, or uh, it's called glycemic index, you have the curve, which is in the blue there, where you, your sugars go up and it stays up and you don't get that high, hyperglycemic dip. Also, we know from, know from many studies, in fact, if you go to Icon magazine, it's an article this week being published by myself, looking at the biochemical changes which sugar causes, which is hundreds, causes insulin resistance, diabetes, insulin like growth factor, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, so it in itself has direct cancer. So what do you have to avoid? Well, I'm sorry to show this to my daughter, and she's gone, oh, look, you're talking about all the things I like. So, uh, so that's pretty obvious, you know, sugary things, we all, we all sort of know that really, don't we? But uh, many people don't really, you know, if you start the day with a bowl of um, Carrot cornflakes and some muesli with dried fruit, you are giving yourself a sugar load. An hour later, you're going to be hungry. If you start the day with sugar free Rice Krispies, nuts, whole fruit, you are not going to be hungry an hour later, you will laugh too much. One of the things I'm really concerned about is adding sugar to tea and coffee, <coughs> very much a British habit. And we're very lucky to be now doing this is our next study, which is ongoing. Hopefully, we'll have the results by July where we're doing an analysis of 155,000 people who've been followed for 10 years, and you can analyze a, data, a, a, a series of questionnaires, and we're stratifying people who add sugar to their tea against not adding sugar to their tea. We only ask the good questions about um, And we, I'm trying to prove, because tea is healthy, and it's got lots of polyphenols, are you, are you counterbalancing it by adding sugar? So we have that data. So if I get shot on the way home, you know, blame Tate and Lyle or any of the others. But, uh, I'm, we see what the data shows, but that's the hypothesis that um, it's bad. Obviously, you can reduce the glycemic index of common foods by obviously having whole wheat bread or having plain bread. <coughs> Extra, uh, organic, wild, sprouting rice, top of the rice chain instead of plain white rice. And even pasta, you can have it mixed with 
expected for will reduce the price. <coughs> Um, the other thing which is, um, as you might read in the article I wrote, polyphenol-rich foods, they actually not only reduce the glycemic index by providing fibre and bulking up the meal so it's, it's absorbed through the stomach slower, they actually interact with the transport of glucose across the, the gut wall. So actually, if you have um, you know, foods with lots of colour, taste and smell, such as those, you actually slow the glycemic index of the same foods if you had them on their own. So that's a very important method. method. And also these foods have health benefits in themselves if they're used for people with diabetes. We also know that, uh, we'll hear more about gut health later, we also know that polyphenol-rich foods interact with gut health. They act as prebiotics. So um, if, you, if you have a, a foods with, with bacteria in them, such as uh, yogurt or natto or kimchi, you're more likely to maintain those bacteria if you have it with polyphenol rich foods as well. Uh, and vice versa, um, if you have um, it, 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 the, the gut, if you have bacteria, you're more likely to absorb the polyphenols more, so they work very well together. Um, so I've mentioned chronic inflammation a number of times so far. And a lot of you will say, well, hang on, inflammation is very important. If you were a caveman and you and you've, uh, tripped over and stubbed your toe and got an infection, we didn't have inflammation, you'd die of that infection. Um, so over millions and millions of years of evolution, we've created this very good innate defense to infection. The trouble is, in the West, we are, you know, we're not, we, we obviously, infection still is a serious thing, but we're exposed to and, uh, carcinogens or, or inflammatory chemicals in our environment, in the foods we eat, in the atmosphere. So our body's constantly thinking we're under attack. So our, our immune defenses is on overdrive. So we have our inflammatory markers are riding high. And inflammatory markers, for some quirk of nature, promote cancer cells. So in the short term, when you've got an infection, it's fine. But we don't want to be doing that every day of our lives. And that's what's happening. So chronic inflammation is a big driver of cancer development and progression. Um, so, you know, what promotes inflammation? Obesity, processed sugar, smoking, carcinogens. What is anti-inflammatory? Exercise, nuts, polyphenol-rich foods, and healthy bacteria. <coughs> you could actually score a meal for its inflammatory content. So you have sugar, lots of saturated animal fats, etc. You get a plus score. So this would be a typical Western diet, you get an inflammatory diet. So if, if you're a, med a Mediterranean, so you've got the um, uh, tomatoes, olive oil, etc. You have an anti-inflammatory diet, and that you get a minus score. The best anti-inflammatory diet is, is, uh, is the, the Middle East, the Far East. Of why I'm going to Japan and telling them how to be healthy, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to be struggling tomorrow because they've already got the healthiest diet in the world. And it's not only with lots of fiber and plant based protein, but it's lots of bacteria, like miso soup, etc., is full of bacteria. Um, so those are the typical things. Um, and yeah, so we know that having a healthy gut or taking additional probiotics has enormous health benefits in reducing inflammation, as we just said, <coughs> stop preventing hospital-based infection, because it improves your immunity. It doesn't just reduce chronic inflammation, it improves the correct part of the immunity. So it helps, it reduces the risk of diarrhea. Hospitals like Norfolk and Norwich are giving people probiotics before they come in now to <coughs> try and reduce um, um, infections. And it can help athletes not get a cold, so they can try and train more, and it's supposed to help her chronic dementia and osteoporosis, let's say. Um, are you going to talk about that trial separately about the MD Anderson? Uh, no. So the really exciting thing is now there's a new drug for uh, metastatic melanoma, which was uh, one of these great PD-1 inhibitors of uh, a uh, uh, biological treatment against a metastatic, a fatal metastatic disease. It costs 80,000 pounds a year. It's a great development for, for uh, mankind. They've recently published in ASCA, you get a 30% better response rate if you have healthy gut health. Because the way it works is you get the cancer cell and you say, here, here it is to the immunity, now kill it. Well, if the immunity is impaired, it's not going to kill it. So 
that's why we've gone in a complete circle. So from me standing up five years ago and being called a quack because I'm not, you know, I'm talking about lifestyle stuff, actually, drug companies are saying, please stand up because I'm going to get a 30% better response rate on a drug I'm selling for 80,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and where do you get your probiotics? Well, I've mentioned food, number one, polyphenols to support it. But in reality, in this country, we don't eat a lot of bacteria. So I always say to my patients, look, if, you, if you're traveling or if you've been on antibiotics or radiotherapy or chemotherapy, you're probably better off having a, a good probiotic supplement. And this is the one we choose because it's got five different strains of prebiotic. It's made in Britain and it's got a short health life, so that's the one I take. And it's not expensive, and some of them are really expensive, and they don't need to be. Um, probiotic chemicals. Um, <coughs> you could probably superimpose um, carcinogens with probiotic chemicals. They're the same things. And these would be your superheated sugars, uh, crisps, batter, Pringles. Um, the other big group of carcinogens would be uh, Heated meats, so you get polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, anything burnt on meat basically. So there's ways to reduce that. You can marinate meat with herbs and spices to reduce the, uh, um, to, to have the natural antidotes with them. Uh, you can eat them with salads. So if you have a barbecue with an Iceland sausage, which is fried black, washed down with a can of Coke and a Pringle, you're not doing yourself a lot of favour. If you marinate the meat in, in, in herbs and rosemary and you eat it with a salad, you still have the taste and the risks are significantly reduced. And there are data on that. Before we leave that, what's wrong with toast? Uh, toast is, is the, it's the black has got acrylamides. Oh, it's it's carcinogenic. Yeah. So there's, if you, if you go onto the website, the cancernet.co.uk, it will show the carcinogen. Tells you how to make foods with less carcinogens in them. Most of the time they're just as tasty, you just need to have some proportions. Uh, so we'll have questions at the end if you don't mind. So, polyphenols, I've mentioned several times so far, we know they, they are literally the gifts from nature. They have uh, enormous health benefits and enormous anti cancer benefits. We know they improve gut health, they know. We know they reduce the glycemic index of sugary foods. They act as antioxidants to uh, um, uh, carcinogenic foods. We know they reduce um, inflammation. Overall, that reduces oxidative stress and improves DNA repair. It has direct epigenetic properties, so if the genes we're born with can be improved. Um, we also know that they can have chemicals which directly affect the progress of cancer from a, a, a single cell to a metastatic state. So they are pretty much a, a, a wonder food. If you want to evidence review, there's been two written recently, and again, if you go onto one of my websites, you can download the papers. And it's not a surprise then that numerous population studies show that people who eat these foods have a lower risk of cancer. How do we increase their intake? Um, well, you could eat lots of rotting, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, which we obviously encourage. In Britain, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the people I meet, for example, I mean, you're a converted audience, I expect, but the average person does not eat polyphenols for breakfast. They will have burnt toast <coughs> with sugar, you know, in the toast. They'll have a cup of tea with sugar, sugar in it, and then a jam on it, which is so, um, anyway, the, the, you can have broccoli soup. Soup is a good way of concentrating vegetables, don't put oil in too long. You can put it in a neutral bullet to concentrate <coughs> too much full of, uh, uh, fruit in it to make it too sweet. Or you can put it in a, a, a pill. And um, I'm talking about pills which, yeah, I'm not talking about pills which have taken a chemical out of food, like vitamin A or zinc or selenium. I'm talking about literally getting a whole fruit or, or a vegetable, drying it, getting the water out, making sure you don't concentrate the preservatives and pesticides, and just having it as like a food capsule. That's, you know, that, you've got to differentiate that because most of the studies uh, <coughs> which have taken a chemical out of food and said, well, let's give that person, say, a, a selenium and
and vitamin E have shown an increased risk of cancer. As you know, in the SELECT study, the vitamin A studies from Scandinavia both showed, very large studies, people who had cancer and gave them vitamin A in a way to try and prevent further cancers had to be stopped because the cancers were higher. Um, there was, um, in the health professionals follow-up study, people who took a lot of zinc had a higher risk of prostate cancer. Um, there is probably a U-shaped distribution, and the EPIC study showed that. So if you happen to measure someone's bl uh, blood and you found a selenium deficiency and you gave them selenium, they would get better than the same price as zinc, copper, and manganese, etc. But we don't know what our, those levels are. They're not routinely measured. Um, but you know, there are st some studies which have done it and say, yes, you do get a benefit if you are correcting the deficiency. Um, in terms of whole foods, again, you've got to be a little bit careful. Um, phytoestrogenic foods, you know, people say phytoestrogens are good for prostate cancer, they might dampen the PSA a little bit. Um, there's not really a lot of evidence to be honest. Saw palmetto, there was an early study which showed a benefit, but when the NCI repeated a much larger study, they didn't show a benefit. Uh, soya extract, although soya is very healthy as a whole food, Put it into a pill, didn't really show any benefit. Lycopene, everyone talks about lycopene in tomatoes. Well, the uh, Gian Venusi study showed that polyphenol rich foods, which included tomatoes, had a lower risk of prostate cancer. But when you took lycopene, which is just one of hundreds of polyphenols, so why they pick lycopene, I don't know. But anyway, when you take that out, give it to patients, there was no benefit. And the same applies to fish oil and all sorts of other things. So, um, so I was lucky enough at the time to be invited to the Complementary Therapy and Lifestyle Committee of the National Cancer Research Network, which is a government body set up to design studies to try to answer questions. <coughs> um, and what we decided to do is, is to say, well, look, we know a lot of people take supplements. We know a lot of people take mineral and vitamin supplements when they shouldn't or take lycopene or all these other things which may or may not work um, and you know, if they don't work they're wasting the money so let's look at the, <coughs> look at the evidence we have an evidence review for over 18 months and these are the four foods which came out as having some evidence at that time of an anti-cancer benefit so uh, they, um, and this was green tea, turmeric, pomegranate and broccoli of course any food within that group, so we have ginger, is similar to turmeric. So it, there could have been another 20, but we had to hold it down to four. Uh, and also we wanted to make sure that if we were to create a supplement, we didn't want four similar foods. They had to be from different food groups, so they would have different interactions, which is likely to be synergistic. And they all, these foods work in different ways. Uh, you know, for example, turmeric has anti-inflammatory properties, broccoli, is 